Hey gang, it's your buddy Platt, and today we live the high life. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So today we have another one of the great classic all-American brands, and that is Miller High Life. Yes, living the high life. Uh, a little background into uh, Miller, or, well first Miller, before we get into the high life. Uh, as y'all may have heard in an earlier video, Miller was started by Frederick Miller in 1855. He originally bought the old Plank Road Brewery. Now we know Plank Road from Ice House. Uh, but he purchased the Plank Road Brewery for $2,300 at the time. Adjusted for inflation, we're around like $75,000. So I'm going to say he got a pretty good bargain on the deal. Now, uh, the story on High Life uh, starts a little bit later. Uh, High Life was not the original beer uh, for Miller. And actually, there's never been a true, quote-unquote, Miller beer. Unlike uh, Paps or Hams or Strohs, where you just... It's the beer named after the guy who started the brewery or whatever. There's never been just a straight Miller beer. Now, a few years ago, they did come out with uh, something they referred to as Miller beer, and it was Miller Red Label 2 or whatever. Never really gained any traction, but the beer that most people have always associated Miller with is Miller High Life. Now, High Life did not come around until 1903, but it was known then as it is today as the Champagne of Beers. Actually, back then, it was more specifically known as the Champagne of Bottled Beers. Now, why that distinction is a big deal is because you kind of have to go back in time. In the early 1900s, around the turn of the century, people weren't drinking a lot of bottled beers. Now, while, yes, technically the uh, technology was there and people did use them, um, again, there was early home, you know, there was home brewing or whatever. As far as on the mass level, it just was not done uh, going back to the 1800s and even earlier, beer was generally a draft thing. Um, again, you, you wouldn't buy it at a package store or anything like that. You generally went to your local tavern and either brought, most people just brought buckets. There wasn't even really growlers at the time. You either drank it there or you bought a bucket to take home with you, but there really wasn't anything in bottles. Miller decided to go with bottles to really kind of ramp up the image of the beer or whatever and they went with the clear bottles and while people today kind of poo-poo on the idea or kind of chuckle of the champagne of beers there was a couple of different reasons why obviously it's a great marketing gag and again if you take yourself back in time you know champagne you, you know uh in the turn of the century there was a real and now we're saying with French culture, so champagne, you know, the champagne of beer, that seems really nice. But also, this particular beer was produced to have a high level of carbonation, thus more bubbles, similar to champagne. Uh, and Miller decided to take this up to another level, and they originally bottled the beer in many champagne bottles. And even the more modern bottles, the bottles we see today, have kind of a long, thin neck like a champagne bottle does. So they had a theme in mind, and they, they went with it, and thus the champagne of beers. Now, um, they also, one of the bottling things they did was they popularized the 7-liter mini bottles. Uh, we talked about this with Mickey's. Mickey's was one of the other uh, beer manufacturers that uh, popularized the 7-ounce bottle, but Miller High Life came out with it in 1972 and really kind of pushed the push that out there and today you could still find the high life now uh one of the things that propelled high life but eventually might have cost it later was uh the branding of it um their slogan for a long time and especially when i was a little kid in the 70s was you've got the time we've got the beer or they had a little slogan when it's time to relax one beer stands clear miller beer and if you think about the 60s and 70s, where a lot of people, especially in the Midwest, working factories and steel mills and stuff like that, and they really catered to this beer to those guys. And again, we've talked about this. The American adjunct lager was a lighter beer, plenty of effervescence, something that would go down easy on a hot day, and that's what Miller catered to. Now, a lot of people say that ended up hurting them later on, when disco came around in the 80s and the working man just did not have quite the uh, gravitas uh, that they uh, did before that. 
Uh, as far as the brand itself, like I said, it saw some hard times in the 70s and 80s. Um, this is when we, and we've talked about this in the MGD video, where they decided that the beer was still good, but they kind of need, needed to rebrand it, and that's when they came up with Miller Junior and Draft. Remember that Miller Junior and Draft is basically high life unpasteurized, to give it more of that draft taste. Um, also, to the popularity of Miller Lite, when Miller Lite came out, that became Miller's uh, alpha beer. Now, High Life, though, ended up having a resurgence, partly due to, uh, in 2002, it winning gold at the World Beer Cup for American Adjunct Lager, and also at the same time, the millennials kind of getting into some of these older brands or cheaper beers, the Paps, the Lone Stars, what have you. High Life was one of the kind of hipster, cool brands that took off but today high life is has made a comeback now it's not again not thought in the same vein as bud light miller like cores like but you know those quote-unquote premium beers but it's uh it's back up there and it's uh headed in the right direction well before we live the high life let's check out the stats So today, I thought I'd talk about one of the great marketing campaigns in the history of beer and in the history of advertising in general, and that was the original Miller Lite ad campaign. You might remember the slogan, especially if you're in your mid-40s and older, it was, taste great, less filling. Uh, actually, Advertising Age ranks this as uh, number eight all-time greatest advertising campaign of all time. Now, it was more than just this slogan, though. Uh, again, Miller, we talked about early in the video, Miller was catering toward the hardworking man, the factory worker, the, the, the guy that makes America. And when they introduced Miller Lite, they wanted to sell this new light beer. Or at the time, some of these beers referred to as diet beers. They wanted to still sell that to these guys. They wanted to get them on board. Well, how they decided to do it was like, we're going to get athletes, athletes and celebrities that they know and love and to help push the beer. The, uh, the original uh, endorser for uh, Miller Lite was a gentleman named Matt Snell, who was the running back for the 1968 Jets team that uh, Joe Namath took to the Super Bowl. Uh, later on, they start getting a lot bigger athletes, Ray Nitschke, Bubba Smith, uh, Bob Eucher, of course, the, the old baseball player and announcer, and the great Rodney Dangerfield, who was just <laughs> funny in anything he did. Uh, also, too, one of the people they brought, they brought in to do the commercials, and it really, I think, set him up for what he became in the future, uh, was a young John Madden that after he had left football, if you know his story, he just was too stressed, and after they won that Super Bowl, uh, I believe Super Bowl twelve, he decided to retire early. He was only... 30s, maybe 40, early 40s, something like that, and he decided to retire. And one of the first things he did was those Miller Lite commercials. He's real animated. He was just kind of really developing the Madden character. And uh, you might want to go back and see some of those because you can see where this would progress. But that was, again, one of the first things he did out, out outside of football. Uh, one of my personal favorite commercials, and uh, for you hardcore baseball guys, was the Billy Martin George Steinbrenner commercial. Um, if you remember their story, uh, Steinbrenner had hired and fired Billy Martin several times throughout the late 70s and early 80s. They won a couple of World Series, uh, or actually won one World Series together, and um, really uh, was a tumultuous story. Well, they did a commercial where they're drinking Miller Lite, and uh, one of them was taste great, and the other was less filling, and they got into it. And I want to say Billy made the comment, here we go again, George. And it's just absolutely hilarious to watch because, again, if you put it in today's context, would you ever see Bill Chick and Robert Kraft doing a beer commercial together? No, but it was just a different time. And think about a guy like George Stanberg. Today, if he did any kind of commercial, it's a company he's owning, not just he's doing a commercial, you know, not just picking up some side work. That was his side hustle. You know, a guy like George Steinberg wouldn't have a side hustle, but it was just a different time. And I urge you to go back and watch those old commercials. They're absolutely hilarious. They, they did some really cool jobs pairing random athletes together to kind of play off each other or different things. I remember L.C. Uh, Greenwood, the old defensive tackle from the Steelers, uh, would do a deal. You know, people would crush beer cans. Well, he would crush kegs. And 
Uh, just several things like that. Of course, again, any of the Rodney Dangerfield or Bob Euchre commercials are just absolute must-watch. But if you get a chance, go back and watch those old Miller Lite commercials. Well, enough about Miller Beer. Let's try a Miller Beer. All right, well, we do have plenty of bubbles. Oh, look at that on the side of the glass. It could be just from a dirty beer glass, but <laughs> lots of bubbles. And we said that pretty nice, thick head. Again, champagne of beers. Let's uh, give her a smell. Uh, not much on the nose. Uh, you pick up a little a hint of malt, a hint of adjunct, too. Let's give her a try. Just nice, light, easy drinking beer. Uh, again, not much to it, but it wasn't designed to be. Now, again, we have to kind of realize when the beer was originally formulated and kind of when it peaked in popularity. Again, in the early 1900s, we were just developing those lager beers from the U.S. And we were just getting down the refrigerated rail car and the packaging and stuff. So again, this was kind of a new idea. Traditionally... Before that, Americans just been, you know, through the colonial times, what have you, we just drunk ales. Uh, again, no one was lagering, you know, beers. You just didn't have the refrigeration for that, so ales were kind of the thing. And so in the early 1900s, this would have been just something new, something different. People would have been really excited about this style of beer. Cut forward to the 60s and 70s, the guys, again, working in the factory, hard jobs, you know, steel mills, whatever. At the end of a hard day, you're wanting something effervescent, light, easy drinking, going down, uh, something that you could probably knock two or three back and not even notice, you know. So again, in our kind of craft beer world, we will bemoan something like this, but again, this is a beer that kind of helped fuel the working guy of the 20th century and uh, fueled the college student of the 21st century. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you'd like me to try, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.